The following program is rated E. Today on City Line, what women need to know before freezing their eggs. I wish I knew about it sooner. So I think education is the biggest thing. We don't realize you hit 30 and you start your fertility starts to de deteriorate. The physical and emotional cost of becoming a mother. This is me in tears because that is what happens. Everything is heightened. Then we test out some viral fitness hacks to see if they really work. The claim is, you know, improve alignment and posture, but also weight loss and get the six pack abs that you've always been wanting. But what are we gonna do? <laughs> this is it. And later, class is in session. What we can learn from Swiftonomics. Not only is Taylor Swift Times Person of the Year, uh -huh. she also is a superwoman powerhouse business lady. It's City Life with Tracy Moore. Have a seat. Go ahead. Um, I like that we tell you to wear color and you listen to us. Yes. You look so good. You look so good. The black's fine. It's okay. <laughs> I don't want you to feel bad. You look so good, too. Everyone, welcome to City Line. So let me ask you uh, do we have any Taylor Swift fans? Oh my God. Okay, good. We're going to show you how you can channel your swift star power to maximize your money. Yes, we're going to get lessons from her. It's Wellness Wednesday, so we're going to start off the show talking about a topic we hear from a lot of our viewers you want more information on. It is egg freezing. It's getting more popular as we have babies later. But what does it really involve? We're diving in as one City Line producer shares her story, giving us the real deal on choosing to freeze her eggs. I'm 37 years old and my biological clock is ticking and I knew that I wanted to be a mom and I, I haven't met anyone yet and um, when this opportunity came my way I was like I have to do this because I want the option I want to know that you know I could meet a person in two years but I still have eggs that are 37 years old it was a, a daunting sort of thing to take up uh, but Dr. Marjorie was really amazing and she was very supportive. This is antral follicular fluid, so the eggs are actually suspended within each of these follicles. Here we would have one, two, three, four. There's some immature ones, and then the larger ones are what are going to inform when I decide to get the eggs out. In terms of treatment for Esther, I had to plan a more aggressive cycle. I wrote the protocol in a way to optimize and maximize the number of eggs we could get out in one cycle and that would entail that she come to the clinic about four or five visits for blood tests and ultrasounds to see how she was responding to the medication protocol that I wrote. And every time she came in, I then reviewed and the team reviewed her results to decide if we increase the dose of medication, decrease the dose of medication, or leave it the same. This is your medication plan for this cycle. Okay. Um, so starting today, you're gonna take all of your medications in the evening at the same time every night. Okay. The scariest thing for me was doing the injections to start off because I was really worried about how I would do that on my own. Take a new needle tip each day. I spoke to Kathleen and she kind of helped me understand what I was going to do for the next 14 days. And then you'll be back into the clinic on Monday. Okay. We'll pretend this is my skin straight in. And she took me through how to inject myself, what was the medication, when do I take it. It does become... You get used to it. Yeah, you get comfortable with it. Look at the size of this freaking needle, oh my god. It was weird at, at first, injecting myself, and everybody around me was like, how were you doing this? But it was not that bad. Like, you start off, you get used to it, and then you are at it, and it doesn't hurt as much. Let's find the third spot. The harder part was to, the, the mental part of it. You know, the physical part was doable, you'll get there. But the mental part of it, just doing this on my own, you're pumped with estrogen, so your your hormones are flying and your your everything is heightened. So I would be bawling all the time. This is me in tears because that is what happens. Everything is heightened and I'm sitting thinking about life and weeping. 
It's really uncontrollable. That's what it is. Okay, so this is today, and her lead follicles are ready. I think she's ready, so why don't we give her another dose, give her her trigger shot tonight for Tuesday retrieval. All right, okay. sounds good. Okay, Thank thanks. you. So I'm sitting here getting ready for the surgery, for the retrieval, and I have a lot of cramping. Um, I'm hoping that it will get better after. So I was excited to get 13 eggs out of Esther. Um, ten of them were freezable because they were the mature type that are freezable, and three of them were immature, so we can't freeze those ones. And that happens when we do an egg freezing cycle. We can only freeze those that will be viable when we thaw them to make a baby later. What I've learned about myself is that uh, I'm extremely resilient and very strong and pretty awesome. Uh, I mean, I knew I was resilient because I came to this country at 33 and I went through a pandemic on my own and I moved with no family. But I think that this has just taken it one notch higher and I feel like I can do anything that I put my mind and body to. And so I'm really happy that I was able to do this with an award fertility. Beautiful. Oh my goodness. Please welcome Esther Casso and Dr. Marjorie Dixon. Oh, I found myself getting emotional because we work together and we know this story. Uh, as you said, lots of hormones involved. It's been a lot of up and down. We're always checking in with you here on the show. How are you feeling today? After the video, a little emotional, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel really happy and I feel healthy. I feel empowered yeah. uh, and I'm really grateful. So very blessed, that's how I feel. What a gr Thanks. great perspective, beautiful. Yeah. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Esther's sto uh, story, Dr. Dixon. How mm -hmm. common is this, is her story? It's becoming more and more common mm -hmm. because previously we couldn't work with eggs because we didn't have the technology to thaw them and make babies after very well. Okay. Now that the technology has changed and with the advent of people getting more and more information about it, it's very common. I talk to patients about freezing their eggs every day now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about risk factors when mm -hmm. it comes to freezing eggs. What are the biggest risk factors? What are the side effects? Um, I'll talk to you about them and then I'll get you to check in, Esther, to see how many, how the, you're being affected by it all. Yeah. So what are the risk factors? So when I talk to patients about freezing their eggs, there are like sort of four main ones. There's yeah. the potential for infection. Okay. Bleeding. Yeah. Pain, mm -hmm. and then something called OHSS, which is an acronym for ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. It's fairly infrequent, that last one, but when mm -hmm. people respond really briskly to the medications, they can have too much stimulation. Okay. But we mitigate for all of those things with medications, and then we manage as people are cycled through. We adjust the medications up or down. Mm -hmm. You know, we know you're a doctor. You've been doing this show forever, but seeing you in that tape, I'm like, and a scientist. Oh, yeah. It's like, oh my gosh, there's something like I'm impressed with both of you. Um, so let's talk about your experience, Esther, after the retrieval. Mm -hmm. um, what was that whole process like for the retrieval? How did it feel? So on the day off, um, there was a lot of cramping mm -hmm. and they gave me something to start off like I knew just before the the actual retrieval happened. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, I was, there was spotting on the day off, there was cramping on the day off, and then I think after two days, I was, it was better. Okay. And I was on antibiotics and I kind of took it easy, I rested it out uh, for the next two weeks, just paid attention to my body. And um, yeah, it, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't too difficult and it yeah. wasn't too uncomfortable, mm -hmm. yeah. You mm -hmm. talk about feeling like you were sort of like full and heavy <laughs> yes. uh, in this area. What's happening in there? So. What happens is that because you've got all of these follicles in there, are just, you know, you're on medication, it's, it's growing and they're all there. All the eggs. All the eggs are there. They're not yeah. allowed to sort of ovulate. You're, right. It gets really <laughs> bloated and heavy. Yeah. So it's a weird feeling. Like, I'd never experienced that before until I actually did this. Right. But it was, it's funny and it's weird, you know, and you're like, okay, something's happening. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> yes. But I'm just going to let it be because, you know, in a few days it'll be fine. I'm carrying mm -hmm. around some precious cargo. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. lots of it. Yeah. <laughs> right? And eggs, yes. Eggs. Eggs. Yeah. Did you recover quickly? After the retrieval? Yeah, I think so. Like, after two days, I was absolutely fine. Came back to work. Everything was okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Good. yeah. Uh, okay, 10 eggs. Yeah. That's what you ended up with in the end, 10 eggs. So 
Would you call this process a success for Esther? Is this what you're looking yes. for? Yes, absolutely. So I have to gauge what I'm expecting from a patient based on the blood tests that we do to anticipate their cycle. Yeah. And in full disclosure, I was a little worried about Esther because some of her parameters were lower than ideal, yeah. but she is 37, past yeah. 35, we're considered advanced maternal age. Mm -hmm. So I was a little worried that we might get even fewer eggs. Mm -hmm. And she like pulled it out in the last minute, she came out strong. <laughs> and uh, so she got 13 eggs, yeah. three of them were immature, 10 of them were of the mature variety. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that we freeze because we know that once we thaw them, they can be viable for future fertilization. And now what's the chance for pregnancies if you have 10 eggs? Okay, so you kind of stratify it by age. Okay. At age 37, if we have 10 eggs that we thaw, mm -hmm. the likelihood of a take-home baby is about 50%. Okay. okay. That also depends on the lab. So you have to know the ability of the lab where you are. Okay. The younger you are, under 35, if you thaw 10 eggs, your likelihood of a take-home baby in our hands at ANOVA is 60%. Okay. So the younger, the better. And then if you get older, past that, 38, 10 eggs, only gives you a 40% of take-home baby. So the sooner you come, the better. Got it. All right. Talk to us a little bit about um, financing this whole process. because. It, uh, I think a lot of people are interested in finding out how long it takes and how much it might cost. So how long it takes, we take about the first two weeks of your cycle. We're capitalizing. Instead of ovulating once, mm -hmm. we give you medications to make you ovulate as many eggs as possible, but you don't ovulate them yourself. We ovulate for you. Okay. The cost of a cycle now, yeah. it ranges somewhere between ten and $13,000. Right. But patients come to it in a variety of ways with a variety of financial tools. So sometimes people have benefits. Mm -hmm. for The big costs are the process, the procedure, the technology, and then also the medications. So sometimes the process is covered, sometimes the medications, sometimes both, sometimes none. Yeah. We also have financing. Sometimes people pay in installments over years. So mm. it really is a variety. We have a patient care service that helps people navigate that because that can be somewhat daunting. Mm -hmm. But we like to help walk people through the journey so we have that service available as well. And that's a case-by-case -case basis. Absolutely. Okay. Esther, you know, I, I loved hearing you say in that tape that you are strong and resilient and you're awesome. A lot of people don't know, like behind the scenes here on the show, we are all in each other's business. And we know that Esther came here with no family and has built a whole community and is now building your own family here in Canada. So what advice do you have for people who are thinking this might be something I want to try? I think I wish I knew about it sooner. So I think education is the biggest thing. Yeah. We don't realize you hit 30 and you start your fertility starts to de deteriorate. Yeah. 35 even more. Mm -hmm. So I would say get that test done. Test your fertility, see where you're at and then start saving up for it if you think that that's what you want to do. And, you know, you, it could be your career, you might want to have kids later, mm -hmm. uh, you, you might not have a partner, whatever the reason is, get that test and yeah. then try and save up for it. Knowledge and is then power. do it. Yeah, knowledge, knowledge is, is power. power. If knowledge I have one power. there, I as a, I've had the same conversations with people over years. Yes. And having the information is what the game changer is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that people are not at the mercy of their biology. Be proactive. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Thank Marjorie. You. We're going to take a quick break. Lots more City Line coming up. You did so well. Coming up, are viral fitness hacks too good to be true? This is, true it's true. It's because you're wishing. You're wishing that that's the case. Are, you, are we <laughs> hoping that it was the answer? Yes. City Lines Wellness Wednesdays is brought to you in partnership with Jameson Vitamins. For everyday immune support, Jameson is here for your health. Fitness trends promise to boost our workouts and get us in the best shape of our lives. But what is fact and what is fiction? I'm just scrolling through all of them when I'm online, let me tell you. Here to help us figure it out is Brent Bishop, <laughs> fitness guru, personal trainer, gym owner, you know a thing or two. So how can we make sure we are following good advice when we're online because we are being bombarded with like the most you know, wild yeah. things happening at the gym and fitness advice. How do we know what's good and what's not? First of all, stop wasting your time on... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, I mean, we Get spend a lot of time phone. online, you know, obviously factor that in. But yeah. 
it's entertainment versus accuracy half the time. Yeah. So you got to remember that a lot of it's for entertainment. Um, you know, I would say be skeptical if something seems like it's too good to be true. Mm -hmm. Then you know you got to kind of research it a little bit. Look for you know credentials. Look for uh, science-based or evidence-based. Uh, information that you can get out there. Yeah. Those things are important to really substantiate it. And at the end of it, if you know like a fitness expert or uh, you know your, even your medical doctor, ask mm -hmm. the questions. Yeah. Absolutely. Especially if it could be harmful. Yeah, get an expert or a professional for sure yeah. to corroborate or more than one source. I'm a journalist. That's what we were That's taught, right. right? Go somewhere else as well. So you're going to help us debunk some of the fitness trends that are happening right now. You all have paddles. So you're all going to weigh in, okay? But the first one we're going to start with is dry scooping. Have any of you heard of this? Because I hadn't. Dry scooping? Okay, first of all, what is dry scooping, D? Well, it's essentially taking pre-workout. So pre-workout contains, uh, well, usually it's caffeine. Yeah. So it can be high levels of caffeine, mm -hmm. boost energy. Also some BCAAs and other things in there. But taking the scoop itself and then just pouring that down instead of mixing it and drinking it like a normal person would. Yeah, you're supposed to drink it. You're supposed to like have it dissolve in water. Right. right. Why are people just eating it? They want that quick boost. They, you know, it's about getting that energy as quick as you can to really okay. boost your workout. Okay, audience, you all have your paddles. True or false? Uh, should we be dry scooping? Okay, we're all on the same okay. page, uh, except for one that says true. <laughs> maybe, maybe we should be. I don't know. Should we? Honestly, this is a hard false for me. That's like, a hard false. You should false. not, I don't recommend it for anybody to do this. Yeah. Uh, part of it is just, you know, taking that amount of caffeine at one time, especially if you yeah. had coffee and other caffeine products throughout the day, you know, your heart's racing, anxiety, <laughs> right. restlessness, all these things can happen. Not only that, but the, you also have the, um, you know, if you breathe it in, you can get yes. something called aspiration um, pneumonia. Ooh. So again, or choking hazards. So it can be dangerous. I'd recommend just take it yeah. like normal. And as a matter of fact, I take about half a scoop or a quarter scoop to start because we all have different tolerances with caffeine. Totally. Yeah. yeah you got to have to be a little mix bit careful Mix it with water, people. That. And mix it with water. Yeah. Okay. Next is something called the five minute Japanese towel exercise. So yes. how does this work? Okay. Let's go through it. So yeah. essentially you have a rolled towel. Yep. We're gonna have a, we're gonna rake down onto the ground. That roll towel is gonna go right in the low back area, so right in your lumbar any, area. Any chance to take a nap on this show, let me tell you. <laughs> well, what this is supposed to do, so it pr extend your arms, extend your legs, you can touch toes and fingers. And the claim is, you know, improve alignment and posture, but also weight loss and get the six pack abs that you've always been wanting. But what are we gonna do? <laughs> this is it. So you do this five, <laughs> so five minutes, uh, 10 times, 10 days for yeah. five minutes is what you're required to do. And are my abs becoming I can shredded see them right, now? Out right now? They're becoming shredded. <laughs> like, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, you all have your paddles. True or false, this towel exercise is the key to great abs. Well, we have a mix. Oh my gosh, a lot of you are saying we true. We have a mixture of responses. Half true, half false. Yeah, it's because you're wishing. It? You're wishing that that's the case. Are, you, are we <laughs> hoping that it was the answer? Yes, me too. Unfortunately, lying for five minutes for 10 days uh, with a towel under your back is not going to give you six pack abs or help you with weight loss. Um, it may improve your, your alignment and your posture and, and stretch yes. out your flexors a little bit. So it's not a bad thing. It's not something you need to stay away from. But right. just what it's doing is not <laughs> six pack abs. It'll feel good if you've just woken up and you sleep on mangled like yes. I do to stretch your back out Absolutely. but there's no yeah. way you're creating abs abs are actually made in the kitchen in the kitchen <laughs> it's what you eat that's really what's is. gonna make your abdominal muscles muscles okay here's another trend I'm excited about this one it's called floor time floor time like the babies We're have tummy right time. Now. this is floor time this is floor time is this the whole trend so the trend is sitting on the floor more often than yeah. you know just sitting in a chair for example is gonna improve your posture yeah your mobility and also enhance your longevity I'm going to live forever because I'm always sitting on the ground at home. I've skipped the couch all the time and sit on the ground. Um, you guys tell me, do you think that we should be sitting on the floor more? I'm going to say true. I don't know if it does so anything, that's though. That's almost 100% true there. Yeah, is it going to make us live yeah, longer? Yeah, I mean, I, I, there's a lot of truth to this. So, you know, okay. sitting in different postures. Again, you have to be aware of your posture when you're sitting. It's not about being slouched. Yeah. So, that's one of the benefits is it gives you more awareness of postural awareness. So you're using your core, your low back, those muscles more often. Yeah. So I think, yes, improving your posture, uh, possibly helping with uh, a little bit of mobility based on your seated position. Okay. But for a longevity standpoint, what's the most important here is the getting up and down from that position. Ooh. Right? So the more you sit, the more you have to get up and down, you get the more up you like focus on person. your mobility. 
There's something called SRT, which is a sit to raise um, test that you can do. Okay. So essentially, you start at uh, 10, score of 10, and then yeah. every point you put down on the ground to get up removes a point off that 10. So here, so that's one. if I get up with one hand, that's a nine out of 10. That's amazing. Right, so some people may need to do two hands and knee. I would do like this. Yeah. <laughs> You're still on the ground though. <laughs> But that's gonna be that's gonna be much more related to actually that's that's great that you're doing the that movement too. That actually felt really good, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. But longevity, mobility, balance—all these things are important to get up and sit down. So if you do this over the ages, yeah, it's gonna help you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Getting up is a big thing, and I think that it's something we all need to practice. Absolutely. Like I know we do it at the gym with kettlebells, but like mm -hmm. just getting up is a thing. I want to talk about exercise snacks. We do not mean food. We've talked about this before. So what's an exercise snack? These are essentially little small snacky. little bursts of exercise, one yeah. to 10 minutes that you do throughout the day. Okay. There's an example here. I mean, doing this 30 seconds of each of these exercises you're seeing, yeah. maybe for three rounds, in under five minutes, you've completed a workout that's got your heart rate up, got you focusing on balance, strength, and all those things. And, and yeah. I think the positive of this is, We'll see what people say first, and I'll, I'll give you the positive. What do you think? Is an exercise snack a thing that we should commit to? I'm going to say true. Brush your teeth yeah. and do this. I it's figure just most a snacky. People... <laughs> it's just a little snacky. Yeah. Real quick, we run out of time. Combine the movement. But it's good? It's good. So, you know, for those who, are, who lack motivation or who have a busy schedule or it's daunting to do 30 yeah. minutes, why not break it up into 10-minute segments? Right. It adds up. Exercise adds up. So it's effective. It's healthy. Let's do that. It absolutely yeah. is. B, thank you so much. Let's take a break, everyone. Stay with us. It's working. It really is. Coming up, using Taylor Swift's success to help us rethink our finances. And we can never, ever, ever get back together with our old mindset, our old money mindset, now that we have a new one. Love it. Swift, let's talk about it. Her effect on the economy is huge. So here with money and career lessons we can take from the successful songstress is David Lester. Give him some love. <laughs> David, I'm excited about this. This is the only way I kind of want to talk about money. So can you break down Taylor's impact in numbers? I sure can. And not only is Taylor Swift Times Person of the Year, uh -huh. she also is a superwoman powerhouse business lady. Mm -hmm. They really should change GDP to GDT, you know, gross <laughs> domestic tailor, because you should see these numbers. Okay. So first of all, 2.2 billion in ticket sales in North America, yeah. huge. 250 million just from her AMC concert that was playing in the AMC theaters that she negotiated herself. Yeah. 200 million streaming, another 100 million from Spotify. You can see that she is, uh, you know, a whole in environmental system herself. She totally is. She's like, a, she's like a nation state. She really is a nation state. That's right? what kind of money she demands. Uh, and then indirectly as mm -hmm. well, the ripple effects are huge. So every uh, ticket holder spends around $1,300 in local restaurants, hotels. You can see that the bracelets, you know, they have like the, her cat's the names. Bracelets. The friendship bracelets. Yes. Exactly. You, Michael's and Etsy's are going through the roof with yeah. their sales. I think it was like 5.5 million through Etsy just for these bracelets, which oh is completely gosh. insane. And then also she supports her friends. Yes. We have um, Kristen Utsuk with their puffy jackets. Yes. She has a deal now with NFL. She gained like 500,000 followers on Instagram. Oh my gosh, what can I make for Taylor Swift? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously, how do we get in here? Yeah, and right? This, yeah. Incredible, and sorry, is. is there anything more in and terms then, of numbers? And then of course, NFL now that she's been dating Kelsey, yes. two million NFL viewers have added been added to uh, the roster. So it's my huge. Goodness. The ripple effects are really big. Who's this Travis Kelsey guy? Just yeah. joking. <laughs> it drives my husband crazy when I say that. I'm like, now we know who he is. He's like, we've always known. Okay, so Swiftonomics. It's a thing. And we what we want to talk about right now is how we can apply Taylor's money, uh, the way she is with money into our own lives, her mindset really. So you say we have to market ourselves. That is the first step. That is the first step is marketing yourself. So you can, people see dancers and singers and performers just for them, but I think the, she has such a huge following because of her integrity and she, what she shows herself on TV is who she is behind the scenes when the cameras turn off and when she's not singing and dancing and yeah. doing these things. And so we wanna be the same type of person. When we have our own businesses, when we're negotiating at work, um, you really want to show the integrity and build that brand that you are coming in early, 
um, you know, leaving late, leaning in at meetings. You really want to show who you are so that people want to work with you and want to do business with you. Yeah, and like, don't be a jerk. Exactly. Because that's not part of her brand, right? Not at all. She's, she's looking out for the people around her, and, and I you, think that counts. She, absolutely, and she's like a jerk head basher. Like, you see what she does in the next point. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, well, we, we should also be ready to advocate for ourselves just like Tay Tay. So that's right. What's your example? So, talking about <laughs> jerks, the private equity fund and also Scooter Braun allegedly went in and tried to grab her masters. And she was like, hells no. And she mm -hmm. went back in. She re recorded all of her six albums, which have broken sales records. Even on TikTok, when one of her old versions was viral, she quickly recorded the new Taylor version yep. and sent it in there and told all her fans to please be downloading this so that, you know, that these private equity people had nothing to do with her success, are, aren't profiting from all the success she has. Amazing. And then because she has a solid brand and people like her, her fans are like, we're only going to listen to Taylor's version. Exactly. So that money goes back into her pocket. So that's also about being not a jerk. Absolutely. So talk to us a little bit about having different revenue streams. Yes. And you can see that Taylor does this too. Uh -huh. Not only does she have the AMC movie contract and the merchandise and the tours and re-recording and owning her own masters, but she has all these different streams of income. So if one goes down, she has other ones. And we can do the same thing in our own personal lives. In this Airbnb play life that we're living in, yeah. we can go ahead and rent out a laneway or if you have a basement or if you have your own business and there's wall space like get artists or someone in the community in there and you can get different mm -hmm. streams of income from the things that you already own yes even now if cars like you can have there's Airbnb for cars too that if you're not Is using there? your car if you're away for a bit yeah you can rent that out or if you have a cottage I didn't know that yeah that's good for that's good for the environment too. Like just, let's share these things instead of buying new ones. Absolutely, and all these extra streams of income. Even once yeah. you build a bit of a um, nest egg, you can create dividend income from it. Mm -hmm. um, and there's all these ripple effects to that. Dividend income is tax referred, so you really want to set up these little. We, we, when we were kids, we learned that we were going to have one stream of income, and that yeah. was it. And then we really have to look to tailor and other successful entrepreneurs and get a bunch of streams of income. So if one goes down, then we have other ones to support ourselves. For sure. Okay, let's talk about giving back. Yes. So Taylor does this. Uh, she does this on her tours. She does this just in her life. Uh, what are some of the things she's giving back to and why should we do this? For sure, it's, it's amazing. During COVID, she would be looking at her Twitter feed yeah. and if someone couldn't pay the rent, she'd hop in and Venmo them money and so they'd be able to pay their rent. Yeah. She saw, I saw this one lady want to go, her dream was to go to university university and she cut the check for her to go to Amazing. university and it's genuine it's like coming from you know the, you can see the screen grab where it's coming from it's coming directly from her mm -hmm. and we can do the same in our own personal lives and build that brand not only is it great to network mm -hmm. because if you're on a board of directors of um, a philanthropical topic that you're interested in yeah. you'll have great networking um, connections you can also if you give money donations there's a tax back for that yep and so you're really walking the walk. You're not just, you know, it, it adds just like the overall brand, just like Taylor does. It makes, makes you feel a little bit better. Absolutely. It yep. makes you feel good. It's an abundance mindset. The more you have, the more you have. Give as much as you can. It'll all come back to you. The only, the only caution I would have, children that are watching <laughs> the show, you don't need to be a billionaire. It's really hard to be an ethical billionaire. Just make enough and give away enough so that you can live a good life. Absolutely. But great tips that we got from Taylor. It's more about the mindset, right? It's more about the mindset than the actual dollars and cents, and right? And now that we have a new one, we can never, ever, ever get back together with our old mindset, our old money mindset, now that we have a new one. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Here for it. David, thank you. Let's go to break. we got more coming up. Never, ever, ever, ever. Coming up stress-free, budget-friendly meal ideas that utilize your whole pantry. One of those ingredients, Tracy, are potatoes. And Canadians waste over two million potatoes every single day. How dare we? Why? I mean, so potatoes yummy. become fries, everybody. Right? Come on. Exactly. Welcome back, everyone. We're in the kitchen because we're talking about sheet pan meals, which are such an easy answer to dinner on busy weeknights. Everything cooks in one pan. You got hands off cooking. You've got very little cleanup, like check, check, check. So here with budget friendly recipes, Trudy Stone joins us right now. 
stress-free, budget-friendly. You're thinking of all the things, and then, of course, you're healthy, too. So yes. it's great. Yes. We're going to dive right in. The first mm -hmm. thing we're making is a sheet pan honey Dijon salmon. Yes. Ooh. You got it. You and got it. And also using ingredients that we often end up throwing out, which yeah. is important to incorporate. We don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. One of those ingredients, Tracy, are potatoes. And Canadians waste over 2 million potatoes every single day. How dare we? Why? I, I mean, potatoes so become fries, everybody. Right? Come on. Exactly. They're Stop versatile. It. You can keep them in the pantry forever. Yes. Yes. So okay. we're using that in this recipe. I've already given us a bit of a head start. So I just seasoned these up with some salt. Salt, some pepper, a little bit of olive oil, some garlic salt, and then I just pop them in the oven for 10 minutes since they yeah. take a little bit longer to cook than our salmon. Okay. And here we go. So I like the little ones. Yes, they're so Very much more nice. fun to eat, I, right? Yeah, they're fun. Right. They're great. So next we're going to make our marinade. So we'll just yes. whip this together. So this is our Dijon mustard. So we'll just throw that in there like that. We got uh -huh. a little bit of honey for some sweetness. Delicious. Throw that in there. Then we got some garlic. Nice. A little bit of lemon juice, right? You get your vitamin C in there and some smoked paprika. So you and I are both big fans Ooh. of the smoked paprika, are we Love not? Love it. Love yeah. it. It's so good. Like, it's just such an easy way to elevate, like, any dish, whether it's chicken, whether it's fish. You can mm -hmm. even put it on eggs like I do. Yes. So Love do that. Yeah. So the next thing we want to do after the potatoes have been done cooking, yep. we want to just take the salmon. We just want to throw it on the sheet pan, okay? It doesn't have to be fancy. We'll just throw it on there like that. And please notice that she's using parchment paper. So yes. this is going to be way less to clean when we're done this. Ain't uh, nobody got time for scrubbing, no. Tracy. Come on. No, thank Come you. on. All right, so I'm going to use this brush, and I'm just going to brush on this marinade. You can just pour the sauce on, but for me, I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. I don't want the sauce everywhere. Okay. So I just like to brush it on like that. You do you, honey. Right. And then <laughs> we got some asparagus, which is yep. in season right now. So we're just going to just drizzle that with a little bit of olive oil. We got a little bit of salt. We got a little bit of pepper. And then we just want to just, you know, kind of mix this all together like so. Mm -hmm. And then we just want to throw it on the baking sheet. Again, you know, you got home late. You don't got a lot of time. You just mm -hmm. pop it on there however you can. This is perfect. You got everything you need in this meal. Right. So we're going to throw it in the oven. Throw it in the oven. So let's open this like that. You want to grab that yeah, one? Yeah, we'll take out our final dish. Amazing. Ooh. Yes. Dinner for everyone. You've got your protein, you've got your carb, you've got your veggies, you are set. This is, yes. I mean, I grew up eating like this. Yeah. You know, like things Healthy, have gotten so easy. complicated in the kitchen. That's right. all you need for a proper meal. Exactly. It's good. Right. Okay, moving right along. We're going to do... We're going to be doing some... Gyro? Uh, yes. Yes. Some okay, gyro? so we're doing Greek. Greek, which I love. I love Greek food because I just love, like, the freshness, the brightness, yeah. everything going on. So much flavor. So we got some Greek yogurt, threw in some olive oil, nice. putting in a little bit of lemon juice in here. And then we got a variety of spices here, some oregano, some smoked paprika, a little bit of garlic powder. We just want to throw it in like that, and then we just want to whisk this all together. Again, like super easy, right? I feel like your spi the spices you add are the things that, that turn the meal from something healthy to something healthy and delicious. Yes. So absolutely. do the combination that you love, but I like getting new ideas for things to put on my food. Yeah, so thanks for too. that. And then we're going to put in the chicken. Yeah. So a great thing about Greek yogurt, Tracy, is that it's a great meat tenderizer, which means it's going to lock in all the juices of that meal. Keep your meat, your meat nice and juicy. Nice. So we just want to toss it in the, you know, in the mixture like so. Do and you what, care if you're using, like, breast thigh? You know Do you have what? a preference? Whatever you want. For me, I just use whatever's on sale, really, to yep. be honest with you. Yep. And that's what makes us a budget-friendly meal. Use mm -hmm. what's on sale. Mm -hmm. And then you're also, like, chopping it up into, like, slices or chunks. So yeah. rather than serving one chicken breast per person, yes. you're chopping it up into chunks, you know, your dollar and your meat's going farther. Very smart. So we throw that on there. We just want to just pop on some onions oh, like nice. so. Throw it in the oven. Boom. Then you got your gyros right here. Oh, this is so good. So she just added some tomatoes, some cucumbers, some lettuce, and we have some pita, and you have got dinner. Right. It is served, or lunch, whatever you right. want it for. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, last thing, we're going to do a smoky portobello mushroom fajita. Fajita. Oh, yeah. Right. I love it. For the plant-based lovers in the house, anybody like that plant-based diet like that would me? Be me? All right. That would be me. This is for you. All right, so we're using this portobello mushrooms, okay? I it's love nice these because these have a similar texture to meat. So yes. these are great in things like fajitas, veggie burgers, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, all right? So what we want to do is we want to cut up our portobello mushroom, cut up our bell peppers, throw it on the baking sheet, yep. get a little bit of olive oil, just kind of drizzle that on like so. 
And this is just like a little mixture of like a lot of different spices. So we got some chili powder, we got some onion powder, I think some chipotle in there, a little bit of salt, Ooh. a little bit of pepper. I like and chipotle. Just mix it all together like that. And Tracy, I'm gonna get you to just throw this baby on. Sure. Just throw it on there. And then oh, you want, it smells good, Trudy. Right, it has a kind of like a smoky kind of flavor yeah, to it. I love right? that. Yeah. And if you want, you can use gloves or you can use your hands. I'm going to use my gloves here because I know I already touched the salmon over there. So you just want to pop on the gloves, and yeah. then you just kind of want to mix everything together like so, right? Mix it all together. You know, portobello mushrooms are something I do not buy enough. Oh, they're so good. And they're so good, so especially good. when you're not when you're looking for plant-based protein sources. Yeah. Like mushrooms going to give you a lot of good nutrients there. Yeah, for sure. So pop it in the oven 20 minutes when it's done. It looks like this. Oh, Put nice. on some avocado, a little bit of lime juice. Yeah. Good to go. Beautiful pitas there and tortillas. Very <laughs> nice. Uh, everything you need and easy cleanup. Trudy, thank you for that. All of the amazing re recipes we've got at cityline.tv. We're gonna go to break. We got more coming up though. Stay with us, everyone. <laughs> it looks so good. Especially coming up, tackling the lack of representation in Canadian media. We connect directly with communities who traditionally are underrepresented in the creative sectors, film and television especially. Diversity in the Canadian film and media industry is an ongoing problem, but there are people working hard to fix that. Here to discuss the road to change is Alexis Ramgalam, and the managing director of POV Film, and cinematographer Ashley Iris Gill, joining me now in studio. So good to have you both. Alexis, I'm going to start with you. Tell me a little bit about POV's mission uh, to increase representation in these industries that I've mentioned. Um, well, thanks so much for having us today. This is really great to be able to talk about this. Yeah. Um, so POV is an organization that's been around since 2007. We operate in a really interesting space where we connect directly with communities who traditionally are underrepresented in the creative sectors, film and television especially. Mm -hmm. um, and we work directly with industry as well to make those connections between um, the communities that we work with and this incredible industry um, that exists here in Canada. Um, and we do that through running training programs and we also just, you know, try to create those access points for folks to enter into the industry. Because it's all about access. Yep. Like you, it's very insider baseball, all of these television shows and films and if you don't know someone on the inside, you're not getting in. It doesn't matter how talented you are. Exactly. So, Ashley, I think this is pretty cool. You went through this program several years ago. Yes. Uh, tell us about your time at POV and tell us about your experience in the industry after you went through the POV program. Okay. Um, yeah, so I did POV a couple years ago and it was amazing. Um, I think for me, the main benefit that I received from POV was just like the resources. Because for me, it's like I didn't have access to like cameras and like lenses and all the gear type stuff. So I was telling, I always say, I'm like, sometimes we know exactly the right tools, but we don't have them. So like, I might be working on something, I'm like, oh, if I had an extra light here, if I had this thing here, it would really elevate my work. So POV, actually, they allow you to do a short film at the end um, of the program, mm -hmm. and then they invite industry professionals to come to that screening. And then you, you have the ability to get internships. So for me, that was amazing because like, uh, White sponsored it, so we got any gear that we wanted, we did a short film, and then um, I ended up leaving there and becoming an in-house DP at an ad agency. Like that was an internship wow. that became a full-time job. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I did that for a few years. And then I pivoted, got signed uh, to Sessler as like they represent me now as a cinematographer and been doing my thing since. Amazing. <laughs> so the work, you're like booked and blessed. Yes. Very nice. Definitely. Working steadily. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how we make sure we're not just checking boxes because that's what happens. A lot of corporations do this. A lot of companies do this. How do we make sure we're not doing that when it comes to diversity and inclusion? So I think it's, it's important to recognize, you know, I think checking the box is something that often makes companies feel really good about themselves, mm -hmm. but we don't really see sustainable opportunities coming from that. Um, so I think it's really, really important that when we're thinking about 
um, diversity. We're also thinking about like how are we creating environments that are truly inclusive mm -hmm. um, and foster support for these folks we want to enter into our our workspaces and you know our production spaces and our creative spaces. Mm -hmm. um, it's beyond just checking that box. I think it's about creating really sustainable pathways for folks to to network and to grow. Um, and then to be able to, you know, share those experiences, which again, I think Ashley can probably speak really beautifully to that, just based on your own experiences in the industry as well. Yeah. Anything you want to add, Ashley? Um, yeah, I think that like we, there is the whole like checking boxes type of thing. But for me, I, I try to not view it that way because I think that can really beat you down mentally. So for me, it's like even if I am there to like check a box, I still have to go and have the skill set to like do the job. Yes. You know, and then within me checking a box, I also have the ability to like empower other people to also like work under me that aren't checking a box. It's like these are just like my creative friends who are people of color, who are women. Right. You know? Because you can see who's skilled and who's not. It's like it's getting past our biases. And I think also one thing that helps me is I always remember that boxes have always been checked. We just weren't the criteria that were, they were looking for. Yep. So boxes have always been checked. Um, we do want to show uh, a bit of the program. We've got, a, we've got like a, one of your ads here from POV. So let's take a look at that right now. Like most of Canada's film and media industries, Todd's studio is mostly straight and white. But by pledging to check their privilege, Todd Studio can now help fund programs to finally create a more diverse talent pool. And Todd, you can stop hiding behind this plan. What? Actually, <laughs> I'm in the vents. Stop hiding from our industry's lack of diversity and pledge to help POV fix it. Just get into it. You got to talk about it. So that's POV's Check Your Privilege uh, campaign. And uh, it's a brilliant campaign because it does talk about how privilege plays a role in the lack of diversity. Before we wrap this up, I want to talk a little bit about what work still needs to be done. How can we all help this situation, Alexis? Um, so I think, you know, something that the campaign really touches on is like really looking at where can we use, we all have privilege, right? I mm -hmm. mean, it doesn't matter what our identities are. Mm -hmm. We all, we're multifaceted, we're intersecting. So I think it's important to really think about like how can we be part of that change? And that's what we really want to do is include everyone as a part of this conversation. I think it can be an uncomfortable conversation sometimes, but it's important to remember privilege is not the problem. It's mm -hmm. what we do with that privilege, right? You know, and Ashley spoke about working with folks in her own networks and bringing people up. Um, you know, with POV, the campaign is really around donations, but there's ways that people can engage with this work as well. I mean, do you have a studio? Are you looking to hire diverse talent? I mean, there's so much that folks can do, I think, to really create an industry that's more welcoming and more diverse. And Ashley, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I think um, to one, like there's one part of it where you can like donate, but I think also to create change, you have to kind of do it from the inside out. Mm -hmm. So I think other film professionals, I think it's definitely like reaching outside of your network, hiring people that you don't often work with, because like the film industry is very cliquey. Yeah. Um, and yeah, sending the elevator back down. Like if you can't take a job, like refer someone else that, you know, is of a diverse group. Um, and yeah, just empowering people through like mentorship and training. Like it's not just about getting a job, it's also like giving them the tools to be able to do the job. Yes. Yep. Okay, fantastic. Thanks so much for that. To learn more about the work POV is doing, visit our website, cityline.tv. We're going to break. Stay with us. to our incredible experts and to everyone watching at home. We love that you join us every day. Our audience here in the studio, you're fantastic. Thank you. And we will see you all tomorrow for Home Day, everyone. Have a good day.